Department of Labor has made it one of their primary focuses. They've added to their budget and increased their enforcement measures to go after the independent contractors. The IRS just in, in, introduced this voluntary program to come clean and tell whether you've misclassified or not. I know in California it's become obviously one of the prime targets for our labor agency. So the attention to this issue is growing, and if we can't decipher between who's the good actor and who's the bad one, who's abusing it and who's not, by an objective definition, then we get those good employers in there who shouldn't be a part of the, the target. No, I agree. Well, we, I appreciate the level of specificity that you come, come in with, no you matter know, how much I, pressure it puts on me. If, if I could throw something out yeah. to be considered, that would push. be that there might be specific rules on independent contractors based on what industry they are in. That might be a way to go. There would be some basic rules about what an independent contractor is, but then may, depending on what industry you're involved in, there might be some variations that could be. In our industry, it's at night, generally. It's off-site. It's somebody else's store. You know, so, or it's a building, something like that. So, are they independent contractors or are they employees? We we would say that the most janitorial workers are employees, and that's and we've been pretty strong on that. The other thing is, Senator, I think it would be wonderful. We think uh, it'd be if the fines were not to go to the general fund, but were to go back to the labor commissioner so that they can continue the fine work they're doing. Okay. Any questions or comments from my colleagues? Thank you all. It's terrific to be continued, for sure. Uh, that'll bring us to our fourth uh, panel, and this is the workers' perspective, impact, impact on worker safety and labor conditions. Um, Sorry, you've been coming in and out. You're here. Caitlin, are you joining him? And Joseph Cruz. All right, which one of you has a universal definition of independent <laughs> contractors? I think we're uh, that everyone can agree on. <laughs> then we're going to split it up. I think we okay. all have uh, similar statistics here, and um, I want to perhaps start from the general you know, overview of why um, we view this issue as very important to particular us in the building trades. Um, Mr. Chair, Cesar Diaz with the State Building and Construction Trades Council. Council represents approximately 350,000 men and women in the construction industry. And as you've heard, this issue has, has impact and continues to impact us uh, heavily and particularly in a down economy, it impacts us even more. Um, so I will talk about the harm to the families, but also um, to the connection of the problem, the state's major crisis right now, which is the deficit um, and our impact on the, and its impact on health care as well. Um, we don't know specifically how much, but you've heard the ranges, uh, 60, 100 billion. I mean, we're talking about astronomical numbers here. Um, that translates into a direct loss of state revenue uh, in excess of about $3 billion a year. This is a significant number, particularly around this time. We're talking about trigger cuts. You mentioned some of the proposals for uh, new tax reforms and services. This is an area, of course, where um, you can either see more underground economy participation depending on which type of reforms are put forward. Um, but when people are paid in cash in the underground economy, they almost never always, almost never have any health care benefits. As a result of this, this causes a pressure on and burden on the healthcare system. Um, it's tr interesting to you know just basically throw these numbers around, but we also have to ask you know what are the tough questions here? What what is the goal of this? Why do we really care about whether people get paid in cash or pay taxes or beat out the government for a few thousand dollars uh, here and there? Why do we care if people use the black market and the underground economy? or the barter system to transfer money and the value of that back and forth. So let's try it this way. When we build a school, what is our goal? Is it to save money on the construction? Is it to make sure that the contractor makes the biggest profit possible? Or is it to make sure that we build the safest and most efficient school for our children? And by educating our children, we build a broader, more equitable community that will offer a better future not only for our children, but for all of us as well. The underground economy is not just a revenue problem. It is also a people problem. 
many new, many newcomers are in this country are forced to work off the books for many reasons. They may not have the legal status or social security cards. They may lack work skills. They may lack language skills or an understanding of their rights in this country as working people. They may think it's better to be paid in cash and avoid taxation, forgetting that they will be, be paid less in wages for the same work with no benefits. You know, we were mentioning the contractor, the roofing contractor in San Francisco. Um, that victim was Miguel Ortiz. He was a native of Mexico. He had been working for a non-union roofing company, and he dreamed of buying a home uh, and actually wedding his fiance in this country. Instead, uh, he ended up losing his life on a construction project when his rope safety equipment uh, that he was tied to, uh, basically, he untied himself, and as he was testing, the roof fell several stories down, and he crushed his skull. Now, although the contractor was ultimately light, indicted, it was too late. And as you heard, they had actually, even after this death happened, awarded this contractor public works projects after after this took place. So with all the body of laws that had been put in place, this contractor was still getting work. Now, that should not happen. And of course, like most business in the underground economy, it had been cited, this company had been cited several times for safety and wage violations. Unfortunately, there are so many wage violations, only a few companies are cited, shut down, or indicted. And we should not tolerate one death. So we believe Miguel Ortiz should not have died, obviously, if there were safety precautions built into this. So we also believe that every person who is paid in the underground economy can be a victim, whether they know it or not. They are a victim of unscrupulous contractors or employers who freely take advantage of workers who have few choices. They are victims of a dead economy that creates jobs with no future, with no insurance, workers' comp, unemployment benefits, nothing. When they need assistance, they have no choice except welfare and public assistance programs. Without question, much of this problem is generated by the side effects of the underground economy and the tragic inequities that it creates. Now, I asked earlier, you know, what is our real goal of combating the underground economy? So I believe that our goal is to continue to build a strong, fair, equitable community that offers benefits and opportunity to every citizen and resident that lives there. To do that, workers must be paid a fair wage. They must be afforded the basic legal protections of job safety and benefits. None of that happens in the underground economy. Worse yet, this impact disproportionately impacts minorities and immigrants who are new to the state. They are the easiest group to take advantage of because of language barriers and unfamiliarity with our labor laws. Many contractors in the residential and construction market have taken the you know, position of, of utilizing them and paying them inadequate wages and benefits. But it's also trickling into public works now because the residential market, as you know, is, is non-existent. So the only game in town now is public works. So it's not just about money. It's also a people problem, but when we enforce the laws to defeat this problem, we increase the public revenues. It's not about a witch hunt, but it's about leveling the playing field for law-abiding contractors. Our, our unions work hand-in-hand -hand with our employers. If they're not getting contracts because of unscrupulous contractors participating in the underground economy, our members are not working. Thank you. Mr. Diaz. Mr. Cruz. Well, thank you, Senator Desanya and Senator Walters and Dutton. Joe Cruz on behalf of the, the uh, District Council of Laborers. And, um, and I want to just commend you for bringing this issue to light and, and keeping it in the forefront, obviously, a major concern to not only the construction industry but the small business and government as well. Uh, the laborers have been active in helping combat and expose uh, this growing threat, the underground economy. And over the last 10 years, Jose Mejia in our office has quarterbacked and facilitated the monthly meetings of a private sector group. It's called the uh, Underground Economy Task Force. And the, under, the task force currently has 100 members and has forged partnerships with state government, labor, the construction industry, and business community to craft proposals and draft initiatives to help police this growing trend. I think some folks mentioned uh, in the construction industry, the, the rise of the underground uh, activities has been mostly in part due to uh, the decline in construction work throughout California. 
Um, and what this does now is it pits legitimate contractors and workers against unscrupulous operators who, through illegal or underhanded practices, still work from those who abide by the law and follow the regulations. Additionally, the economy has had significant effects on the programs uh, within DIR. Uh, Cal OSHA, Workman's Compensation, mentioned earlier, uh, both very important programs uh, to the construction industry. Uh, by utilizing underground practices, such as engaging independent contractors, many employers are evading making workman's comp payments, and construction workers are left unprotected, including many who believe they are, they are already covered, and this is totally unacceptable. When working for an underground contractor, not only are many construction workers not covered through workman's comp, but they are more likely exposed to dangerous working conditions, as, as uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, as Caesar indicated earlier. Cal OSHA, uh, their program through certification and other safety programs minimize workers' exposure to danger. Frequently, these safety programs are ignored on underground construction sites, and therefore they expose their workers to, uh, to harmful working conditions. And not only are contractors, they're not the only offenders. Workers sometimes will only accept working conditions and coverage which they know is illegal and unsafe in order to evade paying taxes. Ensuring the workforce has adequate training in safety and appropriate skills to work efficiently is extremely important to any industry, and the construction industry is no different. Um, while there is no, there, there is no current shortage of, of construction, construction workers now, uh, there is a serious concern that over the long term, the availability of skilled tradespeople uh, won't be at the levels we need when the economy turns around. Uh, over the years, the construction industry has established an effective means of ensuring that there would be an ad adequate supply of skilled tradespeople. The apprenticeship programs established by the industry have been very effective at providing the skilled workforce necessary to meet, hopefully, future construction needs and demand. However, unreported hours are reducing the industry source funding available for training and weakening apprenticeship programs at a time in which we be training our next generation of skilled workers. Um, and finally, by their nature, underground construction practices allow contractors and workers to conduct their business out of the public eye. As such, construction sometimes involves cutting corners, using unsafe work practices, and these, were, these frequently result in a lower quality of product, which requires higher maintenance costs and repair costs at the end of the day. Um, halting and reversing the proliferation of underground practices in California in the construction industry will require uh, work on several fronts, coordinated to ensure they are effective as possible. In the past, laborers have recommended that several possible actions or considerations by state government include uh, obviously stricter enforcement of existing laws and regulations and the expansion of, of programs uh, of, to enforce these, these laws, the Employment Enforcement Task Force, the Economic and Employment Enforcement Coalition, and as recently mentioned, the Construction Enforcement Project. Um, all that are self-funded. Uh, so we have to definitely go after folks who are being perpetrators uh, and violating these laws uh, to bring them, obviously, to justice. Uh, again, I want to thank you for the time, and the laborers staying committed and ready to work together to help solve these problems. Thank you. Mr. Chair and members, Caitlin Vega for the California Labor Federation. I also want to thank you all for doing this hearing and for taking the time to sit through several hours of discussion on this. I think it's been a really interesting um, combination of viewpoints and perspectives. I feel like uh, we have some very uh, creative and thoughtful approaches being done in terms of enforcement. We have people who are true experts at trying to understand these issues and have a lot of experience. Um, and I think that that's uh, really benefiting all of us. I thought the employer panel raised some really, um, some really good points. I know that we have done a lot of bills targeting the underground economy, and we always get up and say this is good for workers and it's good for employers. And it was good to hear from the employer community about the ways that the underground economy does impact them because sometimes I feel like it's more of our side complaining about the underground economy. And it's good to know that there are um, lots of areas of overlap and opportunities for collaboration, particularly um, targeting the underground economy. I think certain industries already have some really good uh, labor management collaboration in this area, uh, which is helpful because enforcement of the, in the underground economy is super hard. In every industry, there are unique um, 
schemes for how to evade the law and how to get away with things that a lot of times our workers know best what's going on and, and other employers and competitors know what's going on. And when they work together, I think that can be very effective at improving enforcement. You know, we talk a lot about kind of how to target the bad actors and, you know, it's always our goal to focus on um, – you know, the ones who meant to do it, the really bad guys, the repeat offenders. I think what's hard in this area, though, is that the reality is if you're in an industry where everyone around you is breaking the law, you know, every year it kind of increases the likelihood you're going to say, wait a second, they're not paying comp, and I don't see them getting put out of business. They're not paying minimum wage. They're not getting put out of business. They're misclassifying. Why am I... Uh, working so hard to be the good guy. You know, it's, it's like sitting in a classroom where everyone around you is cheating on the test and saying, I'll just go home and study harder and hopefully I'll be able to compete. You simply cannot compete by following the law in a lot of these industries. And we have to change that. Um, we, have to, we have to think <clears throat> about uh, how to create real incentives for following the law. Um, when we sponsored a bill... Uh, increasing enforcement for misclassification of independent contractors, I got emails from all kinds of employers saying, you know, I've been an employer for 25 years. I cannot stay in business anymore because I'm having to compete with all these businesses that are misclassifying workers and nothing's happening to them. And, you know, I wonder if there are ways, I think that, you know, our enforcement agencies are doing really great work under extremely difficult circumstances because their funding levels um, you know, are, are back kind of where they were several decades ago while our workforce hasn't only grown, but it's gotten much more complex. And so instead of employers employing people directly, we have all kinds of labor contractors, temporary staffing agencies, different kinds of labor intermediaries, which makes all of this much, much harder. Um, but I do feel like it would be helpful to figure out new and, and um, constantly evolving ways to talk to these employers who are so frustrated that they're stuck having to come to me and complain about um, the inadequacy of enforcement in these areas and the fact that they really cannot compete. And so I think for us, this really is about a level playing field. If everyone pays workers' comp, then nobody is able to underbid someone else because they're not paying workers' comp. If everyone's paying their payroll taxes, then you're all at least on a level playing field. And we may all be suffering because we're in a bad economy and there's not a lot of consumer demand, but at least we're all on the same playing field as opposed to um, you know, contractors being able to underbid each other through, for the most part, squeezing workers as well as cheating our general fund. So I think that um, the other issue is just as we continue to see the economy change, as we continue to see the reliance on contingent work, we have to, be, we have to keep thinking about how to change our um, enforcement approach and how to continue to um, ensure that there are incentives for following the law and that breaking the law isn't just the cost of doing business. Um, and so... Uh, you know, you heard some talk about the financially sufficient contracts law. We have to look at ways that who is really responsible for these conditions and how do we ensure a level of accountability that um, we really are creating a level playing field. And I would just say, you know, for the labor movement, there is nothing more important than rebuilding this economy. And to us, you cannot separate the underground economy from the regular economy as long as there are, you know, port truckers who are all misclassified and having to bear the entire burden themselves, the wages and working conditions for all truck drivers is going, going to remain um, depressed. You know, we are all interconnected. And so when there, are, when there are these huge swaths of the economy that are unregulated and where workers' rights violations are really rampant, um, it's impossible to maintain good standards for other workers, and it drags us all down. So we think that this is urgent, and we think that, you know, with, with the uh, committed team of people that we have um, within the labor agency thinking about how to do this and with some of these labor management partnerships, um, we think that it is doable. We have appreciated working with um, some of these employer groups, with Small Business California, with some of the contractors, to think about things that really do benefit their members and our members. And that's something that we are committed to as we move forward. Thanks.
I, I appreciate um, all of the sentiments expressed. But let, let me, it's an obvious one. I don't want to put anybody on the spot. But on independent contractors, and uh, you know, part of it is, for me, in a fairly simple business, I think of everybody who works for me as, an, as my employee. And it would just be easier that way. So uh, the, the idea, as an example, um, in Scott's comment that in 1995 they were talking about this at the White House. Who's, who's president in 1995? Um, so that's an example of I don't know if it's possible, and you, you guys have been at it for a long time, obviously, so maybe I'm being um, naive. But is there, is there a way to perhaps be more focused on the classification? And, um, and this may be part of me being naive, but if we were more focused, there might be actually more enforcement, and then we're getting we're, – we're driving people away from the bad practices of um, – I, I need to save some money. You're an independent contractor, even though clearly they are an employer. So I know you've been at it a long time, but that's not to say that we couldn't at least look at it one more time. Maybe someplace in the world they would find it more efficiently. Because I'm not looking to weaken it. I just want it. If it's more efficient, it's more effective for everybody. That's a good thing. Right. Right. I think that um, you know the the challenge may be that we may each have a definition that we think is better. It's not anybody. Um, thinking that, I mean, I think clarity benefits workers and employers, right, because it's easier to comply if that's what you meant to do. Um, I think that, you know, uh, we're always happy to ha engage in these conversations. I'm not sure that the business community and labor share a common definition of what they think an employee, you know, how they think independent contractors should be defined, um, because I think, uh, you know, we may tend toward believing people should be employees. They may tend toward thinking it should be easier to classify people as independent contractors. But that doesn't mean we can't have a conversation about whether there's some commonality or some room for compromise and on I this. Don't, I don't even know if it if – I'm assuming it is because there was testimony to that effect. But just within our different um, enforce regulators, there's different definitions. Right. And that, to me, seems right. – that may go to Pete's comment that maybe you need a different definition for a particular um, field – but maybe there's a way to sort of frame that or have an umbrella or, or and again, I, I'm yeah. speaking from lack of actual, the experience you have had going through this for many years, I don't want to suppose that I'm reaching a conclusion that obviously you have more experience at it than I do. Well, I think, I think Pete raises a good idea that there are some differences within industries about the <clears throat> way things kind of should look normally and the way things look when there's kind of a scheme of misclassification. Um, but again, that doesn't mean that we're not open to sitting down and talking these issues through. Um, in terms of the differences in enforcement, I would just say, you know, this issue got raised when we had a bill on independent contractors, and we went to the enforcement agencies, and as far as they know, no one has ever been found by one to be misclassifying and by another not to be. There are slight differences in, you know, the eight-factor tests, but they are pretty consistent. They're all looking to indications of control and how much the person in charge controls the worker. Um, and so I think that that issue has been a little bit overstated in terms of what's actually happening in enforcement. In our view, there is so little enforcement that over-enforcement is not really the problem in that area. Um, but we are always happy to have these conversations and, and try to figure out if we can uh, reach agreement. And just something um, Mr. Diaz said about the tragic example that you mentioned where uh, that you I think you said something about how little enforcement there is, which is, if we could make this more efficient, that strikes me that those, it could, and I, you know, I'm not going to wave the flag of efficiency is an easy thing and we can do that, but the effort to do that I think would be well worth it, particularly the education of employers. In that case, mm -hmm. that employer probably wouldn't have made a, any, any difference at all. Um, um, no, I mean, it had been repeatedly cited. Um, there's uh, um, very the, few cases where they actually debar a, an employer, but you know we're talking about an employer who doesn't care about any of the set of laws anyway. So they can still go out and work and get the bids and so forth. Now there are laws to protect the consumer against that. How much education also has to be provided to the consumer is also a question as well, um, because obviously if they're violating these laws and they are now their contractor's license is revoked. What happens to that contractor? Well, they'll probably get deeper into the underground economy as well, and that has an impact on their workforce, on the consumer.
but also on the law-abiding contractor as well that's actually going out and getting the licenses and abiding by the, all, all the OSHA laws and educating his or her uh, employees. I just go ahead, Kate, well, just on the issue of kind of coordinating enforcement and improving efficiencies, we did a bill like four years in a row um, called the trigger. We called it the trigger bill that was that said, you know, maybe the it's enforcement. A really bad choice of words right now. <laughs> the Perhaps enforcement. If you want to sorry. Do it next year, we'll change yes, it. Yes, good point. <laughs> this was many years ago. Um, the enforcement agencies could get together and figure out kind of what does a really bad actor look like. What are what are the indications that someone is probably cheating across the board? What's a kind of a combination of violations that would trigger coordinated enforcement? We'll call it the coordinated mm -hmm. enforcement bill rather than the trigger bill. And it's, it sounds to me like um, the enforcement agencies are actively engaged in figuring out ways, especially with all of the budget uh, shortfalls, to figure out how to overlap and how to coordinate and be more efficient. Um, but that's something that we've been promoting for a long time to try to – and it is targeting the worst offenders, the repeat violators, and trying to assess, you know, what are the kinds of citations that are really going to um, – be a hammer. I mean, a lot of times the wage and hour stuff doesn't get taken as seriously, um, and employers just consider it worth. It's so it's so um, rare that they do get cited that they figure it's kind of worth taking the risk. I just one last thing, and then if my colleagues have any questions, we'll go to the last um, presentation. It, it strikes me if you just looked at sort of um, this is the most effective way to deter bad behavior. <clears throat> when we get into this discussion a little bit at the informational hearing at the Labor Committee on the Flexible Work Week, is when does a private right of action, when does you use that as a tool versus regulatory oversight? It's just my observation, ironically, and I know what my two colleagues think about this, but as we've sort of starved regulatory agencies for, you know, the economy and whatever reason, um, sometimes people in this building, since they know they can't get a bill like that out of appropriations that gives more than you you don't do that, you just put in a private right of action. I've got nothing specifically against trial attorneys, but it, there's a point where it's not effective. It doesn't seem like it's effective or efficient um, when you're just trying to get after. It's, it's, and we had this little dialogue at Senator Denton probably remembers, um, and it's a problem. I mean, I, I, what I really would like to do is what's the best way to get people to do the right thing? And we can argue what the right definition is as part of our perspectives on life. But we seem like we're really, really not very efficient at, obviously, because this area is growing so right. exponentially. Nothing we're doing seems to be working that well. No, it doesn't. And there right. may be things out of our control, but I don't know if you have any comment. And then if you two have any comments or questions. No? All right. You don't want to chime in on getting after trial attorneys? <laughs> <laughs> I would say we would we would um, support the fully funding the labor agency so that they are able to take on a lot more of these cases. We think that that type of enforcement um, has broader policy implications, deters the bad behavior, and we wish that, you know, these agencies were funded in a way that allowed them to do more aggressive enforcement. Well, it, in that regard, is a very simple business model that, that I keep going back to is if you can raise – the, distance, the funds for the really bad actors and get after them more quickly, but let them, of course, they have to have their due process. Mm -hmm. And it goes back into a fund that specifically doesn't go to the general fund with some maybe some outcomes required of it from the agencies. Would you be supportive of that? Yep. Okay. Talk, talk a little bit about this one. Right. Um, I think, I think for, from our perspective, you know, in – about 40 years, we, we now have what's called the Public Works Enforcement Fund at the Department of Industrial Relations. So for 40 years or so, that fund has been diminishing ever, ever so, you know, more and more. It, it got to the point where there were 22 actual enforcement staff at the DIR to enforce all the labor laws, and including public works. So as long as there's a dedicated funding Perfect. source for that particular pur purpose, we'd be supportive of it. But it, it would have to be something that was built in that could not be paused somehow because of the political winds that shift. It has to be an investment, I think, from both sides of, 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 you know, of the parties to really go after these bad actors and protect those law-abiding um, employers so that we, we really do get that revenue but also level the playing field, as Caitlin was saying, for those uh, employers that are out there doing the right thing. Well, we appreciate them. Um we, I'm sort of surprised that Jose's been working on this for some time and he hasn't remedied it. So, well, he sends his regrets. He got called away on a family emergency, but 
uh, he will continue his good work and, and hopefully, uh, you know, regroup with you at a later time. Okay, thank you. Um, we're almost on schedule. Actually, we are on schedule. So there's one last presentation. Uh, Frank Newhauser, the project director from Survey Research Center of the University of California, Berkeley, and then we'll have public comment. And I take it you're the reason, you must be the reason why we have a screen down behind us. Good afternoon. I'm Frank Newhauser from the University of California, Berkeley. I'm executive director of the Center on Social Insurance. And Mr. Chairman, Ms. Senator, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. It's a privilege, and since you extend me the privilege, I'll try to bring it in on time and under budget. Uh, <laughs> so, I'm going to focus my testimony on two areas uh, that I spoke with Ms. McDonald about, um, and that has to do with the impact of the underground economy, particularly on small employers, through two mechanisms. First, the underreporting and misreporting of workers' compensation, and then second, um, the important impact that we might see as a result of the uh, uh, the gradual implementation of the Affordable Care Act, the health care reform that went through um, a couple of years ago and is now being implemented, and the impact that that might have on the issues that have been brought to you today already. And within this, I want you to think about uh, two areas, um, especially under the workers' compensation of, of, of fraudulent activity. Um, one is those folks that are in the underground economy entirely and fail to buy workers' compensation insurance, pay taxes, um, have unemployment insurance, and comply with a number of other laws. But a second group of employers who you've heard some discussion about today are those that operate partially in the underground economy. They buy workers' compensation insurance or report to the Employment Development Department, but they only – they under-report their employees' payroll. And in many ways, the impact of those employers on their competitors can be even larger than the ones that go completely uncovered. So two types of workers' compensation cheating, um, employers that don't report some or all of their payroll, um, which is simply the underreporting question. And then the second kind is employers that don't report um, their payroll correctly. They may report it all but they misreport the types of employers and employees that they have. They report a, re a roofer as a receptionist, um, a maintenance guy as a hostess, okay, and avoid paying full workers' comp. Like I said, I've heard of that. <laughs> well, I thought that was fitting. Um, and many people, <laughs> many people think that um, – that workers' comp fraud is in, in, in reporting for insurance companies is perpetrated against the insurers in many ways, and, and, and that's who's the victim of this. But I would argue that insurance companies can protect themselves from employer fraud um, to the large extent, especially as a group. And it's smaller employers, especially smaller employers who can't take advantage of things like uh, self insurance or large deductible policies that are most at risk. So think about this from the insurance company's perspective. They have underreporting and misreporting, and often they know about the underreporting and misreporting. They don't pursue it as aggressively as they could, in part because they simply raise premium rates to cover the fraudulent side of the, of, of the process. So employers that are underreporting or misreporting are costing insurance companies more than would be expected, but insurance companies have the opportunity to raise rates to reflect their ultimate costs. And the problem is that that, is a, that falls on the honest employers. And here's a look at the work that we did on this. We did this for the Commission on Health and Safety uh, and Workers' Compensation and for the um, Department of Insurance's Fraud Assessment Commission. And we looked at reported 
um, from a secondary source what workers were reporting as their payroll when they were employed and what in, sh employers were in turn reporting um, for payroll to insurers and self -ins as self-insured employers. And if you think of this as the least risky employers are on the left-hand side and the most risky employers or jobs are on the right-hand side, you can see that for the least risky jobs, there's actually substantially more payroll. The dotted line is what we would expect to be reported in payroll in the system. Not all payroll gets reported uh, because overtime premiums and, and things don't count. But there's substantially more premium being reported in the lowest risk class codes and occupations than there are actually workers. On the other hand, in those occupations, especially the 20 to 40 percent of occupations on the right-hand side that are very risky and have very high workers' comp rates, we see underreporting in the range of 40 to 60 percent of payroll. In some classes, it's 70 and 80 percent. So substantial underreporting and certainly some misreporting of that very high-risk payroll as very low-risk um, employees. And what does this mean for the premiums of honest employers? Well, the premium rates for the lowest risk classes on the left and the highest risk occupations are on the right. The, the dark line is what is, currently, what is currently suggested to be charged by the rating bureau, the pure premium rates by the rating bureau. And the dotted line is what we recalculate these premiums would be with full reporting by by employers, accurate reporting in the classes. And you can see that for the fourth and the 40 percent of employers, the fourth and fifth group on the right hand side of that chart, their premiums are between two and four times what would be fair if all payroll was being reported along with the injuries. So what happens is when you misreport the payroll, you're probably going to accurately report the occupation of the worker. That's because the doctor is reporting the occupation. So the injuries are reported accurately, the payroll is misreported. And consequently, those employers in these high-risk class codes are paying two to four times what would be fair premium. And consequently, they're not only competing against employers who aren't paying their fair share, they aren't paying their right amount, they're also paying substantially more themselves if they're going to be acting honestly. It's hard to be honest in those high class codes. And I think Caitlin discussed this. You know, if you ain't cheating, you aren't really trying in these class codes. Now, there's going to be a, an additional piece that's going, that's going to come into play here, and that's because the health uh, reform uh, through the Affordable Care Act extended new requirements to employers to either offer health insurance or to pay to support health insurance um, through a tax on payroll or other mechanism. If you think about what employers currently pay, the average employer in the United States pays about 8.4% of payroll for health insurance to support employment-based health insurance for the employees. It's the highest cost for employers in terms of the payroll percentage after taxes. Um, Currently, workers' compensation in California is about 3% of payroll under the current um, proposed rates that go into effect in January, um, but 12 to 15% to 20% for higher risk classes. So compare that 8% to the 3%. Now think about what the Affordable Care Act says employers are going to have to pay in the absence of offering health insurance. Now this is for employers with more than 50 employees. It's going to be about 4 to 6 percent of payroll. Um, basically, these employers are going to act like the other employers in, the, in, in their competitors that are already offering health insurance. Some ways, it's leveling the playing field. It's the way we've taken in the United States to support health insurance. But it does mean for employers that aren't offering health insurance now, there's going to be an increase of about 4 to 6 percent um, in their payroll um, for this obligation. And now let's look at who doesn't offer health insurance um, in California. Um, and this is a look at non-union employers. 
and the fraction that offer health insurance that uh, that have health insurance for their workers, or the fraction of workers, I'm sorry, that are covered by health insurance. And this graph again shows five groups of uh, of employers: those with the in the lowest risk occupations and those with the highest risk occupations. Highest risk being on the right, and about 40 or 50 percent of payroll is in that one group, um, the lowest risk occupations on the left. And they offer about 60% of their, well, 60% of their employees take health insurance, about 80% are offered. Um, the four groups on the right are all much more expensive workers' compensation. And you can see that when workers' compensation gets more expensive, substantially fewer employees are covered by health insurance. So those are the groups. Those employers with high workers' compensation costs are also going to be the employers that face substantial increases in, in employee cost because of the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. Um, and the question is, how are they going to react to this? Um, are they going to move, are more of them going to move underground? Um, or are we going to extend and level the playing field for, for those employers? They're going to be offering health insurance um, to their employees like like the majority of employers do, but not the majority in the high-risk class. So just wrapping this up, we estimate that about 15 to $70 billion of California payroll goes annually underreported, um, about 4 to 12 percent. I'm inclined to think that the higher-end estimate there is the more accurate, um, and many more dollars are misreported into low-rate premium classes. Um, the premium rates end up being two to four times higher for the risk for employers that work in high risk occupations and industries. Um, and these premium rates hurt honest employers because they pay excessively high rates and they're competing against employers that aren't paying at all. And there's not very many for incentives for insurers to really actively try to improve reporting. And finally, the introduction of the Affordable Care Act um, is going to mean mandates to increase employers' costs. Um, this is the way we've chosen to develop universal health insurance. It's going to fall especially hard on medium and medium-sized employers with high workers' compensation costs. Um, and this may multiply the tendency of these employers to move underground um, to avoid em higher employment costs. Um, I think the main I think we've chosen this route for health insurance and for workers' compensation coverage. Um, probably the most important thing for the committee to, to consider is how to improve enforcement ahead of the enaction of the Affordable Care Act or the implementation um, to improve um, enforcement and protect workers and, and employers that are operating in the legitimate economy. And and bring into compliance those that are outside the legitimate economy. I don't know whether there's uh, laws in place now to that that are sufficient to allow enforcement of, of failure to supply health, in, uh, health insurance or pay, short of the administrative penalties the federal government would apply, but that might be a way to go um, just to improve compliance. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Senator Walters is convinced you're making her argument for her. Um, we'll have to talk about how we agendize things in the future. I, I appreciate it. It's, it's very thought-provoking. Um, the end, of course, the most interesting part is how do you actually, as the whole discussion has been, how do you actually set up a system where, uh, where you're anticipating people being driven some employers being driven to be to go to the underground economy. Um, once again, how do you incentivize them not to do that? And the implication, of course, here is that because their costs are going up, then they will be incentivized to do the bad thing. Yes, there's no sense that this will cause them to be less than more compliant. Although I think for workers, there's a lot of incentive for workers to to work for employers that are more compliant. Um, and I think there's more incentive for honest employers to work with agencies to improve compliance. And I think you need to work with the workers' comp insurers 
to, to force them to be more aggressive about their auditing and enforcement. The Rating Bureau does a study each year of a sample of employers and uh, of insurers. They go out and look at employers, and all they're looking to do is to see whether the insurer was compliant with the proper auditing procedures on the employers. And they find out that 40 to 60 percent of the time the, in, the insurers didn't audit the employers of, appropriately. Hmm. So there's a lot of opportunity to improve enforcement with the mechanisms you already have in place. Okay. Any questions or comments? If not, thank you. Thanks. Uh, that's our last panelist. Thank you all. We're actually right on time. Uh, any public comment? This is our last thing, so if anyone would like to come forward. Just sit down. Sure, right there. Maybe you can just give us your name for the record, and if you have any affiliation with any group, that would be great as well. Certainly. Um, my name is Mark Cooper. I'm the owner of HED Electric here in Sacramento. I'm also a member of the board of directors of CalPASC and uh, Western Electrical Contractors. Um, I hear, um, I came here today to, with a certain message, but I just want to elaborate a little bit. I've, I've sat here and listened to people from the... Uh, I'm a construction industry employer, mm -hmm. um, but I've also heard people today from the dismantlers and from the janitorial, and I've heard people from labor, um, and, and it, I guess we all have the exact same message. And um, to analogize, similar to the guy from the, um, I, I forget his name, the guy from the auto dismantlers, he had the red car. You know, I'm, I feel like an elect electrical contractor that's in a red car. I'm, I'm saying here, look at me, I'm playing by the rules. Um, you know, come and force me, you know, hit me with more rules, hit me with uh, more taxes because all these other guys are getting away, you know, without paying taxes, without paying unemployment, without paying workers' comp, without paying, um, you know, franchise tax board. There's just so much not getting paid that it's elevating cost on, on me and my business. And essentially it's put me out of business. And what I, what I wanted to analogize is that, you know, we're all out here and we're, we're playing, we're playing football, okay, and, and, those of us that are playing by the rules, we're not jumping off sides and we're not face masking and we're not holding, but you guys are watching everybody jump off sides and they're holding and they're face masking and they're doing the, uh, you know, stomping on us when we're down, you know, the sack and the quarterback and the unnecessary roughness and no, there's no whistles, there's no flags, there's no penalties and it happens again tomorrow mm -hmm. and it happens again the next day and it goes on and on and those of us playing by the rules really do have to question why do we play by the rules and it's our nature, that's why we play by the rules because we're honest and we have high integrity and we believe that this state and the enforcement agencies owe it to all of us that are playing by the rules to start blowing the flags, start blowing the whistles, throwing the flags, and, and hitting the penalties and hitting the fines. There's, there's, you know, if the fine isn't big enough on, on Sunday, the commissioner comes in, he hits him with a bigger fine on Monday, you know, when they review the film. Well, there's plenty of film. You can go all over Sacramento. And we've done this as WECA, Western Electrical Contractors. We hired a third-party investigator because we knew these bad things were going on, and we sent this investigator out to job sites. And they go out and they ask them, let's see your, your certification. It's required by law to be a to work on a job site. You have to be a certified electrician. Where's, where's your certification? Because this government made that a law and requirement. I went out and trained all my employees, and they all went through the apprenticeship program, passed the dream of courses, and they got their card. That was an expense that I incurred, that I continue to incur. The people that ignored that law, they're out there. You can walk from here to a four-story job site right now. They won't, they won't have their certifications, but no one's enforcing it. We've turned it into CSLB. We've, they, they have, my belief is they have their hands tied because the, the fine, the guy's already done the math. The fine doesn't hurt them. Mm. It's a 1000 bucks. He saves that by noon, okay, because he's got 20 guys on the job breaking the law. He saves that. The penalty doesn't hurt him. But if he took his friends with him, if CSLB took all his friends with him, they're here in this room, and took EDD and took um, the insurance commissioner and took the franchise tax board and t took the board of equalization. If he's cheating, okay, if someone jumps off sides, that's not the only law they're breaking. They're jumping off sides, they're holding, they're, they're, they're breaking every law there is. Go in and find them for every one of those. And then my, my, you know, you asked a minute ago, what can we do? What can you guys do? 
put it in the front page. This project, downtown Sacramento, did all these things wrong. Go tomorrow and you put it in the paper again. People don't want to be in the paper. Maybe the fine's not going to scare them, but people don't want to be in the paper. They don't want their job sites. The builders will start enforcing this. There's national builders. I used to work for, you name a builder. I had 390 employees in 2005. I have 31 right now. I worked for every national builder that you can think of. But now what do the national builders want? Do they want the most productive, qualified electrical contractor in town? No, they want the cheapest one. Mm -hmm. The cheapest one, that, and, and they're not asking questions of how come you're so cheap now. They're just, because they don't need to do 30 houses a week anymore. They can do three a month and keep up with, you know, with their need. So they're going down to that level. And there's no reason for them to comply with the law because no one's watching them. There's no flags. There's no whistles. And I think it's going to keep going until you guys blow the whistle and you put the fines out there and come down hard and loud. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. Thank you. Well said. Mr. Chairman, members, Mr. Chairman, members, John Norwood, uh, on behalf of the Spa and Pool Industry Education Council, um, a lot of our members would express that those same opinions. Um, obviously, uh, the underground economy is a significant factor in our business. Uh, it's so per pervasive that, um, as a couple of the speakers said beforehand, uh, there's a high amount of pressure on our members to consider to cheat to compete. Mm -hmm. And you hear that all the time in the industry, and uh, um, it's very frustrating from that standpoint. Um, we compliment, we're very pleased with uh, the effort we've seen the last uh, half a year, at least, with uh, the various state agencies developing coordination to go after this problem. Uh, we have been a big supporter of using technology and existing databases to be able to do this, to be able to identify um, offenders and go after them as opposed to chasing people around on, on work sites. Um, so, you know, that's a, that's a real positive. Uh, our association has a, a form on our website to, for our members to uh, report at non-compliant contractors. We have a long relationship with the Contractors License Board to do that. Other associations do the same thing. The Contractors License Board has a form to use. At our last meeting, the Department of Insurance indicated that they just came up with a new public uh, website. Um, they had one for insurers, but they've come up with one so the public can get on uh, a website and identify and make a complaint. Um, it would seem to me that one real improvement would be to have one single website for all the agencies where you know you can do public service uh, announcements other types of things so you coordinate that so there's one website where you can make a complaint you can uh, put the all the factors in and all the six or seven agencies that have reform, in, enforcement responsibility you know can have access to that website and, and coordinate that approach a little bit more thank you for your attention it's been a long hearing thanks Jim. Uh, Mr. Chair, members, Chris McKaylee on behalf of the California Grocers Association. Uh, as I sat here this afternoon listening to the other panels, I thought maybe uh, we could find the silver bullet, at least to start with. I have an idea. Perhaps you can carry legislation to define good actor and bad actor. And well, start why don't we start there. with lobbyists? <laughs> <laughs> uh, seriously, I mean, I think what I heard was a consistent theme. You know, the state's got an interest in ensuring proper compliance with its laws for obvious reasons and of course also wants to ensure that funds rightfully do the state of California uh, are paid and to those who work work here. Uh, employers want to, uh, you heard, reduce uh, unfair competition and make compliance easier and clearly workers want to ensure proper compliance to assure that their workers work in a safe environment and also are are paid and protected in the ways that the laws were intended to do so and the consistent theme across the board obviously is proper compliance um, so how do you achieve that compliance and I think you know that CGA would uh, share in the comments of the California Chamber and, and, and others saying that one is education and two is the carrot and stick approach if you will I think you mr. chairman early on in the hearing said I think we need to incentivize good behavior and disincentivize bad behavior. Of course, like anything else, uh, that's easier said than done, if you will. On the education front, um, I'm drawn to a lot of the discussion and questions that you raised on independent contractors. Um, 
you know, the the EDD and some of this information is a, a little old. So, but you know, when they began their uh, compliance initiative against certain industries, such as the courier business, as I recall, they audited in excess of three or four hundred businesses, and uh, with perhaps one or two exceptions, found employees in almost every situation i.e. those who are using independent contractor models were found to instead have employees. Now to use our terminology, I can't imagine that almost all the courier businesses in the state are bad actors. So either we're doing a very poor job in educating folks on how to utilize independent contractors. For example, this is simply one, one uh, area of the law, um, but are there better, but perhaps uh, we can see that it's difficult to comply. Uh, we have complex laws. We use different definitions. I thought it interesting that uh, Ms. Kazad from the BOE uh, noted here that in some instances these same state agencies go in and audit the same business, maybe on the same issue, uh, et cetera. So there's a multitude of different laws for employers to comply with, and so we've got to take into consideration the fact that uh, those complex laws are often difficult to comply with and that we ought to start with education before we pull out the carrot and stick approach. I also wanted to give you an example of what we've done in the past on the tax arena, uh, trying to address the underground economy. Um, we go, we, we suggested tax amnesty. Now we've done it three times in the last decade, two voluntary compliance initiatives and one general tax amnesty. And we took a carrot and a stick approach, but I would say that we didn't do it in the right way. The carrot was is that uh, if you pay into this program, then the state of California will uh, waive penalties and possible criminal prosecution. What they failed to do, oh, and of course the hammer is in some instances a doubling of the penalties, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a significant hammer for failure to comply if they find you after the fact. But did they provide enough of a carrot? to actually go after the underground economy. In other words, when folks promoted these amnesty programs, they said, we're going to pull people out of the woodwork. We're going to get those who failed to comply with our tax laws to come forward. And what I think that we've found instead is, is that many businesses and many taxpayers have legitimate tax disputes with the state of California. And because we didn't do enough to incentivize the person who is not today on the tax rolls, what we really got was an acceleration of income that the state may or may not have seen, or we had folks paying in under the threat of those hammer penalties uh, when they were litigating their legitimate dispute and they had to pay in mm -hmm. so that they would not be subject to additional penalties if they lost that legitimate dispute. One example would be waiver of interest. Today, uh, for example, our tax agencies don't have statutory authority to waive to waive, excuse me, interest. It can become very sizable for those who have been uh, not on the tax rolls for a number of years. About a half a dozen, my, my, my last point, a half a dozen years ago I handled a case before the Board of Equalization. It was an out-of-state seller that collected but failed to remit uh, sales tax owed to the state of California because they did business in the state. They wanted to come f forward. At the time, the underlying tax liability was about $400,000. The interest and penalties put it to in excess of $850,000. They simply had no ability to pay, and the BOE's hands were significantly tied because they had no authority to waive off the interest. So going back to the tax amnesty program, I don't think that we created in those three instances a great enough carrot significant hammer on the other side, but not enough carrot to actually bring out the people in the true underground economy. So, you know, have we done enough to go after the underground economy, at least in the tax area? I think not. And in fact, we've just, you know, brought into uh, the tax system more legitimate disputes that have been ongoing. We didn't really find new money, so to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Mr. Chairman, committee members. Just before you go, how did you, how did the case turn out? Uh, we set up a long-term repayment, repayment plan. plan to the state of California. Yeah. With interest. 
you. Sorry, go ahead. No, that's fine. Mr. Chairman, committee members, thank you for the opportunity to speak this afternoon. Um, we come here today because as a company, we have been battling this issue for over 10 years. And uh, privately, individually, we've been battling this for 25 years within our industry. It's not a new issue, uh, as we've seen today. Uh, we have a little bit more of a jaded view on those that are failing to comply. While I would not argue with you that uh, we are overregulated in this industry as businesses, we don't believe that's the reason why individuals choose not to obtain insurance, why individuals choose to pay their employees in cash. They know what they're doing. They choose to do it. They enjoy the advantage that they gain by doing that. And when pressed, they will plead ignorance. But believe me, they're not ignorant. It's not all an education issue. We just two weeks ago, we lost a long-term member of our industry that has fought this issue for a long time. In fact, has uh, participated with and supported several of the uh, groups what, what, that what shared. In, I'm sorry to interrupt. What industry? I'm sorry. Uh, we are a swimming pool contractor and remodeling contractor. Thank you. And this individual has participated with several of the groups that shared earlier today. Uh, faithfully trying to supply names and leads and has played by the rules. Unfortunately, out in the Southern California desert, he finally just had to succumb and could not keep his doors open. This was sad for us because he's one of many that have followed that same path. What was particularly bitter for this individual is just two years ago, working with several of these groups, he submitted 14 names of violators in the Southern California desert. A study was done, an audit was performed uh, using some of the methods that were shared earlier, and all 14 of these individuals were found to have violated the laws and prosecution was started. Unfortunately, to date, while actions have been filed, these same 14 companies are still in operation. And from what I'm told off the record, it'll take another year and a half before they'll finally get put out of business. Meanwhile, our member is what? closing his doors. This was bitter for him, watching those individuals not paying insurance, not paying their people with cash, and stealing the business that would have kept him in business. So while I'm encouraged about the sharing of information, what I was told, again off the record, is that there were barriers to these different agencies sharing the information that would have been necessary to fast track these actions and put these folks out of business and bring them to justice and collect the fines that would help us in this process. There are many solutions. There's not one silver bullet, as was mentioned. There are some simpler issues that we would wish you to look at and address potentially through some uh, legislation. The first is to stop the practice of not requiring the listing of individuals on workers' comp insurance policies prior to an accident. What's basically happening, as was mentioned earlier by the gentleman sharing about workers' comp insurance, you will have companies that will maybe list a handful, two or three, of their workers, usually in the administrative cl classifications, on their workers' comp policies. And then when there's an accident out in the field with one of their crews, they will call up and then add them to the policy at that point so that they're covered by their workers' comp insurance. From what I understand, you have over 30 days to submit a name to add to the policy, even though the accident happened prior to this time frame. Now think of that. If you did that in the auto insurance agency, in the auto insurance industry, and all of a sudden you uh, caused companies to only have to insure one company, uh, one car legitimately, and then if they had an accident with any of their other trucks or vehicles, they could later add them quickly to the policy. How many vehicles do you actually think would be listed on those auto insurance policies? Take it to another extreme and put it into the public, into the private sector. If you only had to li uh, add your car at the last, just after uh, there was an accident, how many families with multiple cars would be listing multiple uh, autos in their policy? They wouldn't, unfortunately. That's what we're facing as a business. Why do we allow it to happen in one segment of the industry? and not put the same standards in others. That hurts all the business. There is no incentive. We talk about uh, incentivizing the insurance companies to, be, to do stricter audits. They're not going to do that. Why would one stand up and put a stricter audit, audit together than another, knowing that the others aren't going to be held to the same standard? Mm -hmm. 
until you put it in from a legislative standpoint, it's not going to happen. Business is not going to cause it to happen. A second area we think you ought to address is that of the general contractors. Uh, we don't want them to turn into policemen or enforcement agents, but there are some simple, reasonable, and straightforward requirements that you could place on a general contractor so that they'd verify that those subs that they're using are legitimate contractors, do have workers' comp insurance, and are listing their employees on those policies. So many of them are using uh, subcontractors that are exempt from insurance, even though by common sense you would look at the work they're signing up to perform, there is no way they can uh, <coughs> perform that work as a sole proprietor. They have to have crews of multiple individuals. There are common sense, straightforward, simple tests that you can require general contractors to implement, but it's going to have to be done legislatively because it doesn't exist legally today. And finally, again, as we shared before with this gentleman in the desert, with this program, there are impediments to information sharing among these agencies. They're not going to share all of them right now because they want to be encouraging and supportive and share all the good things that are going on. But there are impediments with them sharing among agencies. There is no reason that these cases should take four to five years to come to fruition when they have documentation of violations. It's the impediments of that sharing the information that's stopping that quick and swift justice. And I think these issues have to be uh, fast-tracked. If not, you will continue to have discussions about this issue for the next 10, 15 years, and our budget deficits and our state economy is not going to be improved. From a political capital standpoint, if you just address the unemployment or the, uh, uh, this underground issue, you could shave your unemployment rates off dramatically and increase the capital that's been collected in tax revenue from the state. And come re-election time, those would be grand claims to be able to make. Thank you for your time. Wait a minute. Could you repeat that last part after political capital? Um, thank you all very much for joining. Oh, we have more. I'm sorry. Okay. Anyone else under public comment? I'm not trying to inhibit public comment. Thank you. Actually, I'm sorry that Senator Walters left because I did have a comment for her. My name is Jackie Kutz, and I'm the president and owner of Allied Framers, and I'm also a board member of the Northern California Contractors Association of Framers and a member, a board member also of CalPASC. Um, I am appreciative of the work that the regulatory agencies have been doing and the sharing that they've um, expressed with us over the last uh, a uh, year or two now that I've been working with them trying to understand what their needs are and for them to understand what our challenges are. And what I've learned through that period of time is that, frankly, it's taking far too long for them to have resolution to a lot of the um, cases that we've provided to them, spoon-fed basically, you know, with an opportunity for them to uh, put it into some of these flagrant violators, and yet it's taking too long. And so my frustration has been that I'm tired of chasing the violators, I'm more interested in stopping them from getting the work in the first place. And then that, for me, is addressing, as the gentleman did before me, um, those are the awarding parties. Those awarding parties, whether they're general contractor, builder, owner, public agency, they need to have some inherent risk in what they do and what their choices they're making. Right now, they have no risk. It's all reward. They select the bottom line contractor and they have an opportunity to see the huge disparity in bids and knowingly go forward to me is a crime and frankly that kind of activity is putting my business out of business and I'm afraid if I don't continue to advocate for some change in this area that I won't be here next year to have a discussion with you so I ask that we take uh, opportunity to share the responsibility with those that are making the decisions and at least put them aware and for them to deter the, the activity that's taking place. That's what I ask for. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Yes, sir. Yes, hi. My name is Kevin Burns. I'm a landscape contractor um, out of South San Francisco. And I feel woefully unprepared for this, but I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, I am among the contractors who say that I, I'll be – happy if I'm here next year, um, still in business. Um, it's been a struggle these past four or five years. Um, but I've been, I've been screaming from the rooftops 
that we've had a problem with the underground economy since 2003, long before the economy took a turn for the worse. Um, and CSLB has, I've worked pretty close with CSLB for a, for a number of these years, um, and they've done a great job as mu as well as they can. You know, they they do currently have these staffing restrictions. But I think, you know, I'm, a, I'm in a market of the custom residential. You know, I don't deal with a lot of public agencies. And when I go to a project, many of the homeowners, they just, they could care less, frankly. You know, they're looking at the bottom dollar. And we've given them, we've given uh, these, the cheaters, so many places to hide. Mm -hmm. I mean, think of it for yourself. If you called up a landscape contractor to read, remodel a portion of your garden and they gave you a license number and you looked them up on contractor state license board and they have a license and they have workers comp how far are you going to go to check on them how much further are you going to go to check to see what level of workers compensation they have very few people are going to go call up the insurance companies to find out how many employees they insure um but the other the other my, the point I wanted to make was that I know that David Fote has been working really hard to try to get the investigators in our area. You know, I've, I've personally turned in jobs where an investigator came out, came to the job site, issued, you know, told them that they can't, they, at the time they didn't have the stop work uh, authority. But they told the contractor that they're unlicensed and they shouldn't be working. And they took all their signs down. They took all their tools and put them on the truck. And they drove around the corner. And no sooner did the investigator leave, they came right back around and went back to work. And I called them back. I called CSLB back. They sent the investigator out the next week. And they caught him again. So they've been given fines. So I think the number of 60% of contractors, all contractors in the state, should be alarming to everybody that 60% of us don't have or claim an exemption for workers' comp. That's ludicrous, you know. Um, there's not very many contractors I know who, who don't have employees. Um, and the only way, the last thing, point I want to make is that for homeowners to, to disincentivize them, there has to be something, you know, right now all they look at is the bottom dollar. You know, I give them a, I go and tell them that their their new garden's going to cost them one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and this other guy's going to charge them sixty, and that's routine. Um, obviously, it's not the same job we're talking about, but they hear sixty thousand dollars, one hundred fifty thousand dollars. They're going to go for a sixty thousand dollars job, and you know whether or not they get what they wanted, I've lost the work. You know, um, if they. Now with the their ability to stop work, you know, for the CSLB's investigators ability to stop work, that may be the one of the only things I've seen recently that's going to that's going to disincentivize a homeowner. You know, if they hire someone and they have their driveway torn out and it's middle of winter and the investigators come out and say, I'm sorry, you're not licensed, you don't have workers comp or your workers comp isn't you know, we see fraud here, we're gonna stop your job. That homeowner is going to be, you know, there's got to be stories like that that are out there that people start to hear. And people need to hear that stuff, that that, that really happens. But right now, most contractors, I would tell you, most of the cheaters, and I know a whole bunch of them, they just think, you know, nothing's, I've never been caught before. Nothing's been, nothing's ever happened. Even when they did get caught, the fine's a slap on the wrist. Mm -hmm. So um, without, without the increased enforcement, we're, we're fighting a losing battle. It's the Wild West, you know. There won't be any. There won't be any legitimate contractors left to uh, regulate. Thank you, Mr. Yeah, thanks. My name is Catherine Greer. Um, I'm the past owner of Greer Gardens Landscape Design and Installation. It's always been my dream to be in landscaping. I got my master's degree from Michigan State University. I diligently paid off those loans, moved to California, and started my landscape company. My husband, my family, has given me this opportunity to grow my business. 
my company, I am the nest egg for my family, for everything. It's all gone now. It's all gone. And it's gone because of my government's inability to properly regulate our markets. The underground economy is so pervasive. Of course, it's throughout the United States. But when I moved from Michigan to California, I was shocked. And I can tell you from watching this for and, and working on this for 10 years, that there are three major elephants that are still standing in this room that we have not even addressed. Number one, the size of the underground economy. The figures that have been brought forth that I have seen today so far, uh, I, I'm questioning how accurate are these numbers. The number that the International Revenue Service gives us is the 60 to $140 billion number per year. But again, that is, we're talking revenue for federal purposes. There are numerous other major costs incurred that we are missing throughout our state. Um, the workers' compensation costs, the state taxes, the business license fees, the um, the FICA employer contribution, um, employee benefits and health care, as was discussed before. The cost to process payroll, which for my small company, is $125 per month. So if you have a legal company, the burdens imposed by the state of California to allow me to pay these fees are $125 per month. There's an $800 per year fee for corporations. There's an additional fee for the contractor's state license board, which, by the way, has not been allowed to spend the money that I paid them to enforce this, which is shameful. They have money. I paid it to them. They have money to spend for enforcers, and for some reason or another, our legislature, our governor, has not allowed them to spend this money and go get the bad guys that are operating and put me out of business. So elephant number one is the size of the underground economy. You guys have no clue the size. You haven't studied it. CSLB hasn't studied it. DIR hasn't studied it. IRS, that number includes part of the formula, is from 1980. 1988, portions of that formula are so old and aged, it's pathetic to think that we're here in this room talking about the underground economy. You will never be able to control and enforce what you cannot measure. You will not fix it if you haven't measured it. Certainly, we can make a reasonable guess that it's incredibly high. It is in the best interest of our state to go forth and do everything possible to address these issues. But we must quantify it. We must also quantify the nature of the people who are, who are not following these laws. The second major elephant in our room is that the underground economy is intrinsically tied to illegal immigration you will never solve this problem until you come up with some patch to create a legal labor force for construction. Quite obvious, everybody knows it. Everybody's ignoring this underground immigration thing. But it's all tied together. There are many illegal immigrants who are out there who would really like to follow the law. Our third thing is workers' compensation. Workers' compensation has, in my opinion, been a, a, an illegal draw of money, my money, in the name of protecting employees, yet only seven-eighths of that premium has actually gone to the employees. The rest of that goes to the insurance companies. The WCIRB, who's in charge of these rate settings, I, I question how it is that they even are allowed to operate. 
I want my money back. According to what Mr. I think it was Newhauser said today, this company owes me $50,000. I need that for my nest egg. And that's absolutely wrong. In the name of the state, they have done this shakedown of me for 14 years. And I'm telling you right now, I come to you because this is not just anger, this is fury. And I am just one of the very many out there. I've closed my doors. I hope Kevin makes it to next year. And there are many of us out there who are really angry. This has gone on for decades and decades, and we've had, had enough of it. So I really come to you today to, with, with great hope that you will look and recognize at these enormous problems that are bringing down our state. We, our state is doomed without addressing these issues. And I thank you for your time today. Thank you, Ms. Greer. Thanks, Kevin. Anyone else under public comment? All right. Well, Senator Dutton, you have any comments? Well, that the purpose of the hearing is that I think those of us who sat through this all, and I'm sure our colleagues have a sincere effort to try to help um, eliminate it. I'd like to continue the discussion, obviously, so that we have more than a hearing out of this, that we actually um, do something about it. So the degree that I really appreciate all of the people who have come and spoken from the heart and the specificity helps. So if you have anything else, we've uh, recorded everything, I'll try to be in touch with you, that we have some very specific suggestions in terms of collaboration, coordination, and maybe some incentives and disincentives. Uh, so we just urge you to continue to try to find solutions and to give us ideas on how we can act. And we, we will have subsequent hearings as well. So thank you very much for your time. We're adjourned.